was a marvelous testimony to the sovereign grace of our Lord. Her life was a true fragrance of Christ, and uh, I, for one, will miss seeing her, will miss seeing her and talking with her, will miss seeing her in this audience, and uh, will miss the fellowship. But I wouldn't want to take anything away from her. She's with the Lord, and I know that has been her deepest desire. And for Gary, who is in the audience, we extend to you our condolences and assure you of our prayers. This morning as I came in, I had the experience, perhaps some of you did, I carried my umbrella with me all the way on my little over two-week trip, had it in the car on every occasion. It never rained but once, and I was in the car at the time it rained, stopped before I got out. And so naturally when I arrived here this morning, I reached around to get my umbrella, and it was missing. So I want you to know, <clears throat> I want you to know I've been baptized twice. <laughs> and uh, I'm appreciative of the way in which the Lord meets our needs. It appears to me that winter has finally come. We're turning to 1 Samuel chapter 25 and verse 1 through verse 44 for our study of David and Abigail. And uh, this is, in many ways, a very important chapter, and I'm going to take the time out to read the entire 44 verses. So I hope you will open your Bibles and follow along with me. As I mentioned in uh, one or two of the previous occasions, I'm reading from a slightly different version from the King James Version, and so you may notice a few differences here and there, but... That's the reason for it. In chapter 25 and verse 1 of 1 Samuel we read, then, they, then Samuel died, and the Israelites gathered together and lamented for him and buried him at his home in Ramah. And David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. Now it is probable that that is wrong. Uh, there are some manuscripts particularly of the Greek version, that have ma'an, a term that we've had in this context, and that is the likely translation of that first verse. I mention it because the wilderness of Perrin is to the north, considerably to the north, and therefore this is unlikely. In some of the manuscripts, it obviously was a scribal error. Now there was a man in Ma'an whose business was in Carmel, and the man was very rich. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. That was incidentally a time of celebration and feasting. The name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife, Abigail. And she was a woman of good understanding and beautiful appearance, but the man was harsh and evil in his doings. He was of the house of Caleb. The authorized version renders that word harsh by churlish. And that communicates a great deal to me. Churlish is just the word that seems to describe this man, Nabal. When David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep, David sent ten young men, and David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel, go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. And thus you shall say to him who lives in prosperity, Peace be to you, peace to your house, and peace to all that you have. Now I have heard that you have shearers. Your shepherds were with us, and we did not hurt them, nor was there anything missing from them all the while they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore, let my young men find favor in your eyes, for we come on a feast day. Please give whatever comes to your hand to your servants and to your son David. So when David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal according to all these words in the name of David and waited. 
Then Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? And who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants nowadays who break away each one from his master. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my sharers and give it to men whom I do not know where they are from? I've uh, tried to lay a little emphasis on the personal pronoun of the first person. So David's young men turned on their heels and went back, and they came and told him all these words. Then David said to his men, Every man gird on his sword. So every man girded on his sword, and David also girded on his sword, and about 400 men went with David, and 200 stayed with the supplies. Now one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, incidentally, this is one of Nabal's servants, one of the young men, not one of David's. Look, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he reviled them. But the men were very good to us, and we were not hurt, nor did we miss anything as long as we accompanied them when we were in the fields. They were a wall to us, both by night and day, all the time we were with them, keeping the sheep. Now therefore know and consider what you will do, for harm is determined against our master and against all his household, for he is such a scoundrel that one cannot speak to him. Then Abigail made haste and took two hundred loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five sheep already dressed, five seers of roasted grain, one hundred clusters of raisins, and two hundred cakes of figs, and loaded them on donkeys. And she said to her servants, Go on before me. See, I am coming after you. But she did not tell her husband Nabal. So it was, as she rode on the donkey, that she went, out, went down under cover of the hill, and there were David and his men coming down toward her, and she met them. Now David had said, Surely in vain I have protected all that this fellow has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that belongs to him, and he has repaid me evil for good. May God do so, and more also, to the enemies of David, if I leave one male of all who belong to him by morning light. Uh, you can see that David was a little peeved, <laughs> irritated. Now when Abigail saw David, she dismounted quickly from the donkey, fell on her face before David, and bowed down to the ground. So she fell at his feet and said, On me, my Lord, on me, let this iniquity be. And please let your maidservant speak in your ears, and hear the words of your maidservant. Please. Let not my Lord regard the scoundrel Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. Nabal means fool, or foolish, fool probably. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young man of my Lord whom you sent. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, since the Lord has held you back from coming to bloodshed and from avenging yourselves with yourself with your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek harm for my Lord be as Nabal. And now this present which your maidservant has brought to my Lord, let it be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your maidservant, for the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house, because my Lord fights the battles of the Lord, and evil is not found in you throughout your days. Yet a man has risen to pursue you and seek your life, but the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle, bundle of the living with the Lord your God, and the lives of your enemies he shall sling out as from the pocket of a sling. And it shall come to pass, when the Lord has done for my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you and has appointed you ruler over Israel, that this will be no grief to you nor offense of heart to my Lord, either that you have shed blood without cause or that my Lord has avenged himself. But when the Lord has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your maidservant. Then David said to Abigail, Blessed 
is the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. And blessed is your advice, and blessed are you because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging myself with my own hand. For indeed, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has kept me back from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to meet me, surely by morning light, no males would have been left to Nabal. So David received from her hand what she had brought him and said to her, Go in peace to your house. See, I have heeded your voice and respected your person. Now Abigail went to Nabal, and there he was, holding a feast in his house like the feast of a king. They were celebrating the marvelous shearing of the sheep and the prophets that would come from that particular work. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunk. Therefore she told him nothing, little or much, until morning light. So it was in the morning when the wine had gone from Nabal, and his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him, and he became like a stone. And evidently uh, this was something like a stroke. Then it ha happened after about ten days, that the Lord struck Nabal and he died. Now notice the emphasis on the fact that it's a divine act. So when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed be the Lord who has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal and has kept his servant from evil. For the Lord has returned the wickedness of Nabal on his own head and David sent and proposed to Abigail to take her as, as his wife. When the servants of David had come to Abigail at Carmel, they spoke to her, saying, saying, David sent us to you to ask you to become his wife. Then she arose, bowed her face to the earth, and said, Here is your maidservant, a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. So Abigail rose in haste and rode on a donkey, attended by five of her maidens, and she followed the messengers of David and became his wife. David also took Ahinoam of Jezreel, and so both of them were his wives. Evidently that had taken place before this event, because Ahinoam was the mother, I believe, of his first child. But Saul had given Michael, his daughter, David's wife, to Palti, the son of Laish, who was from Galam. May the Lord bless the reading of his word, and let's bow together in a moment of prayer. The subject for today is, as mentioned in our calendar of concern, is David and Abigail. I said calendar of concern, our bulletin. I looked for the title in the calendar of concern last night to be sure I had it right, couldn't find it. This practical chapter has some very important lessons for the Christian, which are very easy for all of us, I think, to see. And one of them that stands out is the ease with which we often fall from the will of God. It's no wonder that the apostle in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12 admonishes us, wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. David was a great man, but it was very easy for even a man like David to fall spiritually. And of course it illustrates also this particular chapter, the blessedness of the fact that we are often kept from either further, for even further falls, that we would surely have experienced were it not for God's grace. We are kept by the power of God from so many false steps, from so many sins, from so many diversions from the will of God. And this chapter illustrates that. David is kept from just such a mistake as is evident. The chapter also has some important lessons for unbelievers as well. The Lord Jesus told a parable in Luke chapter 12 of a rich man 
And his name might well have been Nabal because the words are words that make one think of Nabal. In Luke chapter 12, I'd like to read a few of these verses because they do fit so well with this incident in 1 Samuel chapter 25. And this is the parable that Jesus spoke. Then he spoke a parable to them saying, the ground of a certain rich man yielded plentifully. We might change ground to sheep. And he thought within himself saying, what shall I do since I have no room to store my crops? So he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build greater and there I will store all my crops and my goods. And notice, notice the emphasis on the first personal first person pronoun, just like Nabal's expression in 1 Samuel 25. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many things laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And Nabal illustrates that as well, being very merry as he celebrated the fact that his sheep had borne so much wool. But God said to him, fool, this night your soul will be required of you. Then whose will be those things, whose will those things be which you have provided? So is he who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Then he said to his disciples, Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, nor about the body, what you will put on. Life is more than food, and the body is more than clothing. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which have neither storehouse nor barn, and God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by worrying, can add one stat cubit to his stature? If you then are not able to do the least, why are you anxious for the rest? And so on. And he goes on to remind them that life does not consist in the things that we possess. The scriptures tell us, reminding us over and over again, the time is coming when we too will pass from this existence. It's appointed unto men once to die and after this the judgment. That's an appointment that you have. That's an appointment that I have. And it's an appointment that all of us will keep. I think of the way in which we live, and I'm reminded of that unknown saying, exercise daily, eat wisely, die anyway. It's appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. And I can tell you one thing. You will find more wisdom in the rooms of this building, more true wisdom, more useful wisdom, more wisdom that will aid you in this life by the greatest of percentages than you will find down at the end of the street in the buildings down there. We so forget the things that are important. This chapter is a marvelous portrait of individuals. There is David, a man, a great man, a man upon whom God had put his hand, but a man who nevertheless must be guarded and guided and kept by the providence of God or he will step into sin in almost any circumstance. Abigail, the scriptural proof that it is possible for a beautiful woman to have brains. She was a beauty and she was a brain. That's clay, plain. And Nabal, the fool. Hardly anyone could be more a fool than this man who lived for the possessions of this life and did not care at all for others. Even though the law of God had laid upon every Israelite the responsibility to care for the unfortunate. David's men, Samuel, marvelous little pictures all through this chapter of individuals who should be lessons for us. The author begins by reminding us 
of the fact that Samuel met that appointment about which I was speaking. Then Samuel died. He met his appointment. A great man, so useful in the history of Israel, the first of the prophets, and the Israelites gathered together and lamented for him. Isn't that interesting? They didn't pay a bit of attention to what Samuel said. As a matter of fact, Saul, you remember, didn't even know about Samuel. And yet they lamented for him. So characteristic of us. The man of God leaves and we lament for him. In fact, we garnish their tombs and sepulchers, but we do not pay attention to what they have said, guided by the Holy Spirit. So he died, a man responsible for David's dazzling career in one sense, and exemplifying himself. The Lord seeth not as man seeth. Men look on the outward countenance. The Lord looks upon the heart. One of the lessons that Samuel himself learned. Now the characters we've mentioned, Nabal is described as being very rich. He is described as being churlish. The Hebrew word means something like rough or hard. Evil. He was not a hood himself, but he had the same kind of disposition. And notice, he was the how of the house of Caleb, a degenerate plant on a noble vine. The house of Caleb. And incidentally, Caleb is a term that's very similar to the Hebrew word for a dog, Caleb. So here is one who is a descendant of Caleb, but something of a dog himself. And then there's Abigail, whose name means something like the father of joy. Beautiful, not dumb. One of those women of whom the Proverbs speak, a wise woman who builds her house. And David. We read, and David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. Often in Scripture, and I don't want to lay much stress on this because I'm not sure the extent of the stress that we should lay, but often the physical activities of individuals reflect the spiritual. Abraham goes down toward Egypt and falls into difficulties. David goes down to the wilderness of Ma'an, and it's the beginning of a step that is ominous. And uh, were it not for the providential care of God, David would have fallen into a very, very serious sin. David's request was very common, and it, there was nothing about it that uh, was uh, bad. It was a time of lavish hospitality. Nabal had thousands of sheep and goats. The time of shearing was always a feast time, and he courteously and deservingly, because his men you remember David is not on the throne yet, and he has his men, his 600 men, and they are on the go constantly in fear of Saul. But being in the territory protected the sheep, the sheep men, the shepherds, from others who might have come and stolen the sheep. So he courteously and very deservingly asks that Nabal out of the largest, which was his, supplies men with things that they needed. Uh, it's possibly a lack of trust, but the Scripture doesn't say anything about that, so we take it to be the kind of thing that would have been perfectly appropriate. And the reply of Nabal will give you an insight into the man. Who is David? Who is this son of, the Je of Jesse? There are many servants nowadays who break away each one from his master. Shall I then take my bread, my water, my meat that I have killed for my shearers and give it to men when I don't know where they are from? And I think again of that parable our Lord told about the rich man. Now David's response is the kind of response that John Wayne always gave in movies. Okay, men, 
get your holsters, get your guns, let's get our horses, and let's ride over and teach them a lesson. You notice how it's put. David said to his men, every man gird on his sword. So every man girded on his sword, and David also girded on his sword, and about 400 men went with David, 200 staying with the supplies. But meanwhile, back at the ranch, some other things were happening. And so in verse 14, now one of the young men told Abigail, and this is back at Nabal's place, some things were happening there too. As a matter of fact, God was working in spite of what David was doing. So uh, this is one of the lessons that we learn from the Word of God. When we are reviled, we are not to revile back again, and David was in error. One sin is a stepping stone to another. And so when he went down to Paran, if that's an ominous note intended for us in reading the Word of God, here is the next step. The failure of David was been being too occupied with second causes. What he was concerned about was not the sovereign Lord who was master of all of his activities, but he was interested in men and thinking about what Nabal had done in the insult that he had received. So often we fail to remember that our steps, the Christian steps, are steps that are guided by the Lord God in heaven. The things that happen to us are things that have passed through the marvelous omniscience and providential care of our great God in heaven. We should not react as David reacted. That's one of the great lessons of this incident. And in this case, one can see it all through the chapter. Do not answer a fool according to his folly. We read in the Proverbs. And uh, David is answering Nabal in a foolish way. The fool has said, I've got all of this, this is mine. Uh, why should I give it to some servant who is broken away from his master? I don't know who David is. I don't know who his men are. And David answers him, were it not for God's sovereign grace in a foolish way, by getting on his horse, so to speak, and going to slay him. Now, beginning in verse 14, however, we have the second movement in the story, and this takes place in Nabal's home, Abigail, apprised by one of the young men of the things that had taken place, of how David's men had come and asked for some of the provisions of Nabal and uh, had received the kind of answer from Nabal that was sure to provoke David and was surely wrong. And so Abigail, in a marvelous show of wisdom, pacifies David with the gift that should have been given. And I like what that young man said because the young man is Nabal's servant, but he too knows he's a scoundrel. For he is such a scoundrel that one cannot speak to him. So we go on and read in the account of how in verse 23, now when Abigail saw David, she dismounted quickly from the donkey, fell on her face before David, and bowed down to the ground. This is a marvelous expression of faith. You may not uh, catch it until you read the things that follow, but it's obvious that this woman knows something about the promises that Samuel had expressed with reference to David when David was anointed as the king to be, because listen to the things that she says. And note, of course, that this is before the expression in detail of the great Davidic covenant, which will be outlined in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And so we read in verse 30, and it shall come to pass when the Lord Oh, let me go back a few verses and uh, to verse 24. She fell at his feet and said, On me, my Lord, on me let this iniquity be, taking the responsibility herself, and please let your maidservant speak in your ears 
and hear the words of your maidservant. Please let not my Lord regard the scoundrel Nabal, for as his name is, so is he, fool. And he's foolish. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives. Now that's a remarkable statement because as you can see, what she suggests is that David's soul lives as the Lord lives. In other words, what she suggests here is the union of the Lord God with David. Or to turn it around, the union of David with the Lord God. As the Lord lives and as your soul lives. She recognizes that there is a connection between David and the Lord that is an eternal connection. Since the Lord has held you back from coming to bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek harm for my Lord be as Nabal. And now this present which your maidservant has brought to my Lord, let it be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your maidservant, taking the blame upon herself, for the Lord will certainly make for my Lord an enduring house. Bayith Eman, one of the little expressions that appears in the Davidic covenant, an enduring house. This, of course, ultimately finds its consummation in the birth of our Lord Jesus who rules over the house of David forever. And so the Lord will certainly make from our Lord an enduring house. She somehow has grasped the fact that God has intentions for David and his seed that have not been expressed very fully so far. Because my Lord fights the battles of the Lord and evil is not found in you throughout your days. Yet a man has risen to pursue you and seek your life, for the life of my Lord will be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God. And the lives of your enemies he shall sling out as from the pocket of a sling. Now I want you to notice something that's very important here. That what this woman does is to plead, in effect, to let the coming glory regulate present actions. The present is to be regulated by the future. Now that's one of the greatest of the principles of the Word of God, that our actions today are actions that are to be regulated by what God has said is going to take place in the future. For example, we are told by the Apostle Paul that every one of us who has believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, every one of us shall someday stand before the judgment seat of Jesus Christ to, re to receive the things that have been done in the body, whether they be good or worthless. And any Christian who keeps that constantly before him will be a better Christian. To regulate our life today by God's grace and power in the light of the future is the kind of life that a Christian is called to live. The present regulated by the future. Now David, of course, is an individual who is remarkably responsive to the things of God. Think of the Psalms that he's writing all of this time, telling us to rest in the Lord. Now he rested in the Lord and to wait upon the Lord. And here is one who warns us and exhorts us and admonishes us to wait on the Lord who didn't wait on the Lord. Reminds us that even the greatest of the Christians have their problems. But notice how he responds. And Abigail gives her great speech to him. In verse 32, David says to Abigail, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. Convicted. And now responsive. He gives thanks to the Lord God because he senses in Abigail the providential care of God for him. Blessed is your advice and blessed are you because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging myself 
with my own hand. You know, there is a need for all of us to receive reproofs. And most of us do receive reproofs. I live with a reprover. Martha's excellent at reproving. And most of the time I listen to her because it's an objective voice. And uh, I think if you knew me without Martha and knew me with Martha, you would say the latter is the better of the two. So here is a man who listens to a reproof. Again, in the Proverbs we read, as an earring of gold and an ornament of fine gold, so is a wise reprover upon an obedient ear. That last part is the difficult, the obedient ear. The world loves to recall our sins. The, love, the world loves to recall the one sin that we may have committed that stands out of the others. They love to recall the few sins of the outstanding believers. And my Christian friend, it's not easy to wipe out the blot of one of those sins. The best way to avoid the difficulty is to not fall and to remember that God in his marvelous grace guards our steps. Well, the last part of this chapter after that supplication of Abigail and the success it brought in David's life is an account of retribution and requital, remarkably parallel to the, prod the parable of the rich fool. The individual who was not rich toward God, but rich toward men. So we read of Nabal in this way. There was a feast. Nabal's heart was merry with him. Eat, drink, and be merry, as our Lord said in the parable. That's the way of the rich fool. Eat, drink, and be merry. merry. Nabal, happy over his successful ranching, speaks about the possessions that he possesses, not recognizing at all that it is God who in his sovereign providence has enabled him to be the kind of man he has become economically. Always reminds me of that story which I have mentioned more than once in Believer's Chapel. Dr. Truitt was entertaining at the time at one time, was being entertained one time in the home of a very wealthy oil man in Texas. And after dinner, the man took him in his large house up to the top of the house and showed him his wealth. He looked one direction, and it was filled with oil derricks. And uh, he looked in other directions and showed him the other things as that he had, and he said to Dr. Truitt, Dr. Truitt, I came to this country 25 years ago without a penny. Now I own everything as far as you can see. He motioned south toward the derricks. Then he motioned eastward toward the waving fields of grain. He motioned westward toward a great virgin forest, and then to the north, the huge herds of cattle that he possessed. And then he said, all this is mine. 25 years ago, I was penniless, but I worked hard and saved, and today I own everything you can see in any direction from this roof. He paused, expected Dr. Truett to praise him a bit, but to his astonishment, the praise didn't come. And Dr. Truett, and anyone who knew him can easily see how this might well have been exactly what he did. He put his arm around the individual he pointed toward the sky and he said, my friend, how much do you own in that direction? Being rich toward God is the important thing. I guess that as I think of this chapter, the one lesson that stands out more than anything else is that God in his sovereign providence guides the steps of his believers. And David sees that. He knew he had taken a misstep. He knew he had determined action that would bring blood guiltiness upon him, and he saw in Abigail the means by which God stopped him in his sinful path. 
And then also he recognized something else too, for in, when the news was told to Nabal, and in the things that happened to him, the stroke that came, and then the death that came, he recognized in that the divine retribution. And so he said, Blessed be the Lord who has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal, and has kept his servant from evil, for the Lord has returned the wickedness of Nabal on his own head. The certainty of the recompense of the wicked. In the Proverbs again we read, Behold, the only time incidentally that that term is found in the Proverbs, the righteous shall be recompensed in the earth, much more the wicked and the sinner. If you look around in the history of men, you will see that. You will see it in the history of Israel, in the destruction of Jerusalem, and in the tragic way in which Israel down through the centuries has been the object of the disciplining hand of the Lord God with a view to the promises and their fulfillment that lie in the future. You can look at a nation like Germany, a, no, a German nation guided by a demonic leader who led Germany down a path that has meant the disciplinary, the, the retribution that God brings upon those who depart from the teaching of the Word of God. The Lord smote Nabal. Give place to wrath. Do not give place to wrath. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. David learned a great lesson. It was not his to bring vengeance upon Nabal. It was the Lord God to do that. The best of man is always in danger of a fall. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The worst of men, like Nabal, face eternal judgment. Those who fail to recognize the Lord's anointed, who is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Nabal's death was only the beginning of sorrows for him. There are people who say, I don't believe in hell. The only hell we shall experience is that we know in this life. Well, the Word of God tells us something different. The Word of God tells us that the only heaven we shall know is this life if we reject our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I was riding in the automobile on Friday coming home from Natchez and Martha was driving the car, and I was listening to a rural preacher preach. And it's very interesting to me how some individuals who don't have any education in religious and spiritual things at all really come to understand the fundamental facts of the Word of God. This individual is giving a little exposition of Jeremiah and the potter, and the clay. And he made some very interesting statements about the clay and the potter. But what he was really talking about was the sovereign grace of God. He never used that term. I don't know that he knew, knew that term. But he said, look, he said, when the potter was there with the clay, the clay didn't say, now I think I will go over to the potter and have him make something out of me. And he labored that for a while, and there was a lot of shouting and amens in the background. It was like an, a, a big entertainment. That's what it was. But he went on speaking about how the clay is just clay. The clay is just dirt. And he even made a reference to Adam, because men are made out of clay. And he had, really, the truth of the whole thing within his heart, even though it wasn't put in the kind of language that our theological seminaries, our sound theological seminaries, might have appreciated. Then he went on to talk about how he was saved. And he went on to talk about the fact that it was not a salvation that he himself had sought. He said, I didn't seek this salvation, but the Lord, I love this expression, the Lord lassoed me and drew me back to himself by the Holy Spirit. And he said, furthermore, he said, I cannot understand the Bible. 
He said, can you understand the language of a will and the legal jargon of it? You need someone to interpret it to you. And God has given us the Holy Spirit to teach us the Word of God. And so on he went. The lessons of the Word of God are so plain and clear, it's remarkable we don't see them. If you're in this audience and you've never believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, the salvation that he has accomplished by dying for the sins of sinners is available for individuals such as you, for you are a sinner. But in coming to Christ and receiving as a free gift not by joining the church, not by observing the ordinances, not by good works, for you have no good works that are pleasing to God in the ultimate sense. In coming to him and receiving as a free gift what God has given, thus acknowledging your utter incapability of doing anything that pleases God. God gives in grace eternal life. Come to him. Believe in Him, trust in Him, and receive the life that comes from God. Thus, you become the object of the sovereign care and providence of God, preserved from many a fall, and ultimately brought into the enjoyment of communion with the Lord God in heaven. As your soul lives, so God lives. That's true of all believers. Come to Christ, trust Him. Let's stand for the benediction. Father, we are grateful to Thee for the lessons of the text that we have read. We thank Thee for the greatness of David and also for those experiences which teach us that no man is ultimately like the great son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ. Deliver us from the failings, the falls, the grievous sins that destroy the testimony of the Word of God as seen in our lives. If there are some here, Lord, who have never believed in our Lord, we pray that thou wilt impress upon their hearts their need and Christ's provision in the blood that was shed on Calvary's cross and draw them to thyself. For Jesus' sake, amen.